Итак, сегодняшняя презентация — это на самом деле результат многолетней работы. Я хочу сказать, что я на самом деле подобную презентацию проводил на конференции ООН «Хабитат», когда организация «Хабитат» осуществляла принятие новой городской повестки дня. На самом деле, впервые за 40 лет мы действительно начали понимать, что общественные пространства являются критически важным элементом, который связывает в себе тот город, который, этот элемент, который объединяет город. All of you could try to think about why it might matter to you. Do you go to public space to relax, to recreate? Do you go there to reconnect with friends, to remember memories? Do you go there to revive yourself because you live in a small apartment and getting out into public space really makes you feel refreshed? Um, do you go because there are religious ceremonies or do you go to reinforce social ties by having large picnics? Um, uh, do you uh, use it to reconstruct community? And I don't know if this reads, uh, I also added, or do you think it's mostly important for improving uh, real estate value? But I think all of us can agree at both an individual and community level, and these are uh, pictures from India, all three of these are important public spaces representing the kinds of individual and community meetings that public space has for us every day. But I am equally interested not just in these individuals, recreational, sort of the thinking about public space that I think most of you do all the time. I'm also really, ah, sorry, it went too fast. Um, Переключил слишком быстро. As a symbolic or a civic letter at both societal and global. I mean, public space doesn't just matter to us as individuals um, in terms of religion, but it also matters in terms of a whole definition of the city or of the society. Um, it is often the symbolic center of civic life. I was trying to think, I guess the Kremlin, the public space of the plaza, is that representative, representative of civic life. It's a forum for discussion and democratic practices. It's a recognition place of racial and cultural diversity. Um, it's a place of circulation of information, at least in Latin America, and again, I don't know here. Um, this is a place that people come together, and long before we had newspapers or the internet, people talked. And this is where ideas were fomented and where politics began to, be, to develop. So, The circulation of information isn't just digital, it's also very important that people talk to one another. It is a place where all publics, um, that's the idea that um, there isn't just one public, you're not one public, you probably make up many different publics, I don't know, I can't without interviewing you find out, but that the, all different publics can be represented as well as counter publics that might be in some cases excluded from some forums, but again in, in public space, even those uh, contesting uh, the organization that is in control um, are represented in public space. And in that way, public space uh, can allow for the expansion of the public sphere. And in this case, by public sphere, I mean the number of people that actually participate in making up the ideas and the thoughts and the traditions and the everyday life that we are all part of. So public space matters in incredible numbers of ways, um, both societally, globally, as well as at this individual community level. Okay, so here's my ideal public space. Actually, it's not so ideal anymore than when I first had this picture. This is Union Square, um, but what I use it for is just to show you the kind of diversity of activities and work 
and uh, there are people playing, there are people selling things, there are people going into the subway, there are people shopping, there, you can't see them, there are people resting. And, and for me, an ideal public space is something, that, a place where everyone can be. It's very idealistic, I accept, I accept that, it's very utopian. I've begun to write more about the fact that I think that contact and contact theory is very basic to our creating the kinds of societies that we all want to live in and that the way we can move towards greater collectivity. Um, this kind of uh, public space for all is an ideal but you need, when I talk, to know in the back of my mind, I really want us to have spaces, at least some spaces, not all spaces, but some spaces where you would have the opportunity to meet people that you wouldn't otherwise meet. So, based on this ideal that I'm arguing for and the idea of the importance of the symbolic and civic center of the city, public space becomes really basic to civic life. It provides the potential for civic life by offering physical and I think virtual, even if we start thinking about the internet, and I, I'd love to know what you think about that, that it is also a virtual site for civic life by our offering this places for people to come together safely for discussion, for cooperation, and as I was uh, interviewed about, also for conflict. Because it's through the working out of conflict between groups that in fact we have greater understanding. And civic life in a just city, which is something that I am committed to, as are many planners, um, I think, and many architects and many designers, and certainly social scientists and urban anthropologists, uh, a civic life in a just city needs to be based on diversity, equity, inclusion, and the recognition of people's rights to the city. But the question is, how do we achieve it? I mean, if you agree with me. So based on 30 years of public space research, we've really found that there are some things that we can do. And there are power processes, dynamics, design and planning decisions that can either influence whether you have the kind of public space that performs in this way or whether you have a public space that doesn't work. All right. I'm not used to um, the restaurant up above, the bar. This is a very, uh, it's a public space. I don't know, is it a public, are we in a public space? I guess we are, so. Um, I wanted to say a word about the kind of research we do. Um, as all of you know, um, part of the reason that I've come is not, just, is not just to address you, but is also to visit with your incredible Center uh, for Urban Anthropology. It's the first center of its kind in the world, as far as I know, in which uh, urban anthropologists have come together to actually consult on improving public spaces. And one of the things that we want to keep in mind is anthropological research, traditionally, was you went to a place and you lived there for a year. You go to a village, usually, in the city you go, and you live there for a year. Actually, I went to Costa Rica for 20 months. And that's all very fine for our analysis, and I wrote a wonderful book over that and many other visits. But the real reality of our everyday lives is that we need ethnographic methods that are really applicable in our contemporary urban environment. And this is something that your Center for Urban Anthropology has really taken on by finding and developing new methods. Um, the method that I have used for most of the research that I'm gonna talk about in this talk um, is, 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 I call it REAP, REAP? This, I don't know if it translates, but Rapid Ethnographic Assessment Procedure. Um, it's historically associated with action anthropology. In other words, it was developed in order to intervene, actually usually in health crises, where you had to go in and, and, and analyze an area very quickly. Um, the method emphasizes collaborating with the local community. It's a cooperative method, and the basic methodology is the triangulation of different kinds of techniques. 
and I'll give you an example. And what a REIT does is it provides really a snapshot of the social dynamics of a place at any one time. So you can't read this, I'm pretty sure, but let me just give you, no, but I wanted to give you some, just to give you some idea of what your colleagues are doing, right? I mean, the, you know, it's, it's not easy work. Everyone thinks, oh, you're so lucky, you get to work in public spaces. You travel all over the world and you go to every public space. But actually, I use, usually lose about 20 pounds when I do the research. Because you do many things and you often do it in a team. You do behavioral mapping of where people are, what they're doing and at what time of day. You do transect walks where you'll walk with people and ask them to take you across the site and tell you what they do in their everyday, a, a very personal view. You do individual interviews. If you work in a place that has multiple languages, then you have to be doing, I usually interview in English and Spanish and French, but mostly English and Spanish. And if I need Chinese or I need Russian, then I hire a student who knows that. Um, you do expert interviews. We were talking about that actually today in the conference, right? That you talk to the people who run the parks. You talk to the municipal authorities. You talk to the managers of the park. You talk to the people who run the schools nearby. Um, you do a lot of participant observation that I won't have time to talk about, but that's the hanging around and watching what happens. Because what's so important about participant observation is it's really only through you being there and seeing what's happening and then thinking about what you're being told and what you're seeing that you can begin to understand a space. It's the contradictions, the inconsistencies between somebody says, oh, this is such a safe place, and then you see that there are no mothers and children there at all, all right? And then you ask yourself, so why are there no mothers and children if they're here if it's such a safe space? And it begins to focus you in on understanding. We use a lot of historical documents um, to really understand any space. I talked about that this morning. You really need to understand where that space came from, what its history was. Here in Moscow, it's incredibly important. And you often do focus groups. And all of this you do in a couple of weeks. So you usually have a team of people. And the magic of it is, is even though it's done in a very short period of time, you have many different kinds of evidence, many, many kinds of data. And by moving back and forth and using those different kinds of data, you can begin to formulate better questions and get insights into what's going on. It's not perfect, it's never perfect, but it's so far the best method we've come up with. So let me now turn to the main topic. I'm going to talk about four kinds of threats to public space. And I think I've already taken up quite a bit of time, so I may have to drop some, so you'll tell me. But I'm going to talk about, first I'll start with lack of representation. These are all reasons that a public space might not be used, or might not be successful, or might have tremendous conflicts. We're going to talk about privatization. I understand in the context of Moscow, it may not make as much sense, but you'll see the pictures from New York and you watch television shows, so I think it'll make sense. I mean, the kind of privatization that's going on. Securitization is my term. I've done a lot of research on how we secure places and um, it's really how, how uh, the demand for being safe expresses itself. And finally, I'll turn to social injustice. So let me start and um, let me just check, where's Larissa? How much, how much, time, how much time do I have? Okay, okay so I'm gonna start with lack of representation. Okay, this is uh, our Independence Hall where the Liberty Bell is in Philadelphia, all right? That's, and this is a huge park, and it was built by our National Park Service. And the National Park Service was really concerned that no one from Philadelphia used this park. There were plenty of tourists, just like going to the Kremlin, you know, with huge tour guides. And, but no one locally, and it's a very, very large park. It takes up maybe a half of the center of the city. And so they asked us to come in and do a, a REAP. And what we did is we um, interviewed 
people that they had identified groups that they wanted to use the park. There were African Americans who lived in a housing project that was not very far from here. We interviewed Vietnamese newcoming immigrants who had moved into a neighborhood very near. We interviewed Puerto Ricans and other Latino groups. We interviewed um, Italian Americans who traditionally are also in this neighborhood. And we interviewed um, Jewish Americans who had traditionally lived in this neighborhood, but actually no longer live there. And what we found was, I'm trying to see which, uh, no. What we found, I have to go back. Go back. Go back. There. What, what, I, what, the, what we found was, just what I think we would find, I've decided in the Kremlin, if, if you want some thing, is, I, I'm not sure, I shouldn't make any decisions, but it, what we found is locals said that there's so much for tourists and nothing for us. It, there, everything there was for tourists. And African Americans said the only thing black at independence is the ink on the Declaration of Independence. And the Vietnamese said, well, you know you have this Liberty Bell, and the Liberty Bell was about colonialization of, of, uh, in the US, of, of the uh, of Americans throwing off the colonialists of England, all right? Why don't you interpret this, this bell as colonialism for us, too? Because we see the uh, Liberty Bell as being important. But in other words, what we found over and over again, and we did these maps, which I had wanted to show Dasha, these are kind of cultural resources maps um, in which we actually plotted where people had memories, where they had special meanings, what places their parents used to go to that they don't go to anymore, and we found some incredible things. We found that this is Washi Washington Square there, um, it was the first African-American burying ground, uh, cemetery, the very first one in the United States. And there was no sign, no recognition of it at all. The very first Jewish uh, cemetery was actually Mikveh Israel up here. No sign, no information. There were no tours in Spanish. There were no tours. There was nothing that represented the people that were there, and yet... You could tell from this map after our research, we could take it to the park and say, these are places that really matter to the people who live here. And I must say, in this case, I was very lucky because 20 years later, they have in fact done all the things that we suggested and it's now a place that is used by locals. It took a long time, but there is now a museum on slavery. There are our tours uh, in Spanish and all kinds of la languages. Very, being, moving a little more quickly, this is, a, this is a <coughs> Pelham Bay Park. This is in the Bronx of New York, uh, where my husband is originally from, back there. And there this, and um, this is a place that has become very, very popular with Spanish-speaking populations, particularly Caribbean and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rican. And it's been really fabulous. It's great for a park. It's a really big park and a beach. And so they have summer dances and salsa and music and movies and picnics on Ocean Beach, and it's really been claimed by the Latino population. However, there are still all these original uh, people who lived in the Bronx who were, I don't know, we call just sort of average white working class people who would live there, and they felt marginalized. So representations complicated as I guess what I'm saying, that sometimes we can do very good things with reintroducing new kinds of symbols through dance and music, but yet we need to be thinking about the cultural sy symbols of all the people that use a park because otherwise you end up marginalizing. So a, a loss of co cultural symbols can be problematic. A third example is Prospect Park. I live near Prospect Park. And this is a case, this was the original Olmsted uh, boat, boating house. It's in the park. And it was the most popular place in the park. People went there and rented boats and had dinner and had picnics. And when it was restored, however, they didn't put any of the social activities. They just made it look beautiful, put it back to its 1870 form, and had no programming. Nobody used it. Why? Because 
to restore historic uh, preservation without the original social functions will not necessarily work if you want to have the same kind of interaction. Olmsted was very committed to using public space as a place for people to come together to make for a better nation. And here they were restoring it and making it very beautiful. The architects did a beautiful job, but without the social uh, apparatus and the programming, it was not a successful space. I'm actually going to now, I'm going to skip, but I already said something about adequate territories for everyone. That's another piece. Privatization. Um, oh. So commercialization of public space um, is very controversial in the United States. Oops, I went. Do I do it again? Let me just try one more time. There. Very controversial. This is a small park, and um, actually, it's not in New York. It's in Chicago, where you can see all the advertisers have their pictures and whatever, and then the top is a mall that is right near a public space. But it is quite controversial um, because really most of the people, the gurus of public space in New York, believe that you must have a certain amount of commercial activity to have a, a successful public space. But we have also found you can commercialize something to such an extent that people can't afford to go there, they can't get a cup of coffee, they can't uh, do anything because it's become so highly commercialized um, that it, it, it's not it's not acceptable for you to be there and not spend money, which immediately, again, creates a, another kind of situation. This was, I was telling the interviewers, this is Herald Square. This is a small park where teenagers used to hang out all night long. Do you know Herald Square? <laughs> yeah. And um, we were talking about, you know, the teenage, they didn't want the teenagers hanging out. This is in front of Macy's. So they started a, um, a bid, a business improvement district. Do you have business improvement districts yet? No, but these are business, this is where all the businesses are taxed and then they keep the street clean and make decisions. Again, taking it away from the public. And what happens, of course, is now the kids don't have any place to go. And um, this has become a very exclusive space rather than the kind of open social space where teens could go because of the controlled access of gating and also the governance which getting into governance, here we are on overregulation. I showed this slide this morning, but um, with privatizations come long lists of rules. Um, here's one for the Sony Plaza, and it says, uh, let's see, you can't sleep, lounge, loiter, or disorderly contact, you can't smoke or drink, you cannot have shopping carts or unintended packages, you can't gamble, um, you can't do any kind of gaming, no crowding or blocking of doorways, no playing of loud music, no obscene language, no running, skating, or bicycling, no bringing in pets or animals. This is a public space. Um, anyhow, but the point is, each of those rules, right, is meant to exclude somebody. Either homeless individuals who you don't want sleeping there or kids who might want to have a bicycle. I mean, each, sim each one of these rules. So with privatization creates these. And this is a sitting wall that says there in English, please do not sit on the wall, you know, even though it was designed by the landscape architect. And finally, um, where's my translator? Here's my slide. Um, I'm hoping you understand this, but what happens in that kind of world, um, and you really do see it in the United States, and you do see it in Latin America, that a new kind of moral geography occurs that is based on how much money you are worth, or how much money you have, or even how much debt you can take on. Uh, I hope I'm being clear. In other words, here we have, you know, a man who is only worth $2, and a woman who is a, her, it has too much debt on her credit card, and on and on and on. And we call this the financialization of everyday life. Um, and this is a kind of consequence of extreme privatization in that suddenly it isn't just that you don't have money or you do have money, but it becomes a moral issue. Okay. Securitization. 
Um, this is New York City. This is San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, zero tolerance policing, which uh, came into practice in New York City after 9-11, which was the, um, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, in, in case 9-11 doesn't resonate here. Um, they had zero tolerance policing. This kind of extreme securitization keeps all kinds of people out of public space, not just homeless individuals or criminals or whatever who you might somehow feel shouldn't be there, but anyone, anyone who is afraid or concerned about the police, and which includes youth of color, includes all immigrants, includes some elderly, includes vast, anyone who looks like they are a Muslim or Islamic, Huge numbers of people are excluded by really extreme policing. Surveillance. Again, Costa Rica, this is a tower right over one of my public spaces that they, that they have started, and a camera at the top. Extreme surveillance um, does, again, do the same thing. There are lots of people in the world, at least in the United States and in Latin America, who do not want to be captured on camera, and they don't go to public spaces. Most Latinos, immigrants in the United States right now, don't go to public spaces. Why? Because they could be seen and recorded and be asked about their legality or their documentation. Barriers as well as, this is Wall Street, barriers as well as uh, bollards. These are sort of technical terms for those architects and landscape architects in the audience. You don't need both, this sense of a fortress public space, and racial and cultural profiling. These are two different cultural settings. This is a young man at NYU saying, I'm a scholar, not a criminal, having to do with racial profiling in the United States. And down below is this Costa Rica, and these are Nicaraguans in a plaza who are being uh, bothered by the police just because um, of what they look like, because it's assumed that Nicaraguans um, will somehow be criminals, which is not the case. So securitization, and there's so much more now. Now we have face recognition technology and all other kinds of surveillance. And, and you may say, well, we need surveillance. We need all of this to be safe. But in fact, as I've demonstrated in another book on the, um, behind the gates on gated communities, that more surveillance, more policing, more gates, more bollards, more, 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 only makes people more uncomfortable because it reminds them somehow that they're insecure. And the only answer for securitization is for people to come into contact and to know one another. And there we, there's no magic cure. And finally, social injustice. I think these are pretty easy. Um, unfair distribution of space. The top is the Bronx and the bottom is Central Park. Spaces are not treated the same. If we want a just city and just public space, there needs to be a fair distribution of public space and of the quality of public space and of the maintenance of public space. There is clearly a message here of who, it, who counts and who does not count. Lack of procedural justice. This takes a little more explanation. Um, Procedural justice is, is the kind of justice you get through the court in which they could decide against your case that you know you may not win, but at least you felt that the procedure was fair. So that people tend to feel better about decisions that are made in a fair way. This is a case here of the Mission District in San Francisco in which uh, some neighborhood kids who had been on, had a soccer field, they happened to be uh, Spanish speaking Latinos, had used this soccer field for their whole lives and their fathers their whole lives. And one day a guy shows up and he said, you can't play here, I paid $27 and I reserved this soccer field. 
and it was essentially the privatization of the soccer field. Well, the kids fought that they had a right to this public space, but what in fact had happened is there had been no procedural justice. The city had on its own talked to these companies who had come in, in this case, this is Google and the tech companies that are taking over in San Francisco, and made a decision that some people could, that they were gonna charge money, which would t totally change, again, the character of this soccer field. And this is the mayor reversing this decision. Um, the other has to do with pricing. This is in Peru. Recognition of difference. It's really important in public space, both representation that I've talked about, but also the recognition that we use public space in different ways. We don't all use public space in the different ways. If we want to have public spaces where we can meet people that we would not otherwise know and where new kinds of ideas and new kinds of relationships and new senses of who we are as a people, really, if we want that to happen, then we need to begin to recognize difference. I would say, just like uh, your colleagues at the center, at the Center for Urban Anthropology have tried to convince people that people have different cultural meanings of those spaces and they need to be respected. So if there are young people in the new pit, as it's called, and that they go there to hang out and that Misha and Dasha worked on, particularly Misha said this is sort of his space, this, this is this is a good thing, to not recognize that youth maybe use that space in a different way than maybe the neighbors really might use it is important, that we tolerate very different ways of using space whenever is possible, and if we create conflict, then we work together to solve it. And finally, this is a lack of interactional justice by authorities, another thing that can destroy public space. I mean, we talk a lot about justice and the just city. But usually we just think about distribution. Does everybody get a piece of public space? But it's really not enough. The procedure by how it's allocated, the recognition of difference, something I don't even mention here is whether we can care for the public space and care for one another, but also the lack of interactional justice by the authorities. These two young men are sparring. It's a kind of uh, fake, fighting that is very popular among them. The police came by and thought they were fighting and arrested them. Um, here is a case of a lack of recognition of difference. I mean, actually, in this slide here, which I didn't talk about, from Lewinsky Park, this is in Tel Aviv, this is in South Tel Aviv, these are Sudanese immigrants. And they are not recognized as citizens, and they aren't recognized from a cultural point of view. They're not recognized from a citizenship point of view. And, and they end up living in public space. So these are just some of the examples of the ways in which public space can deteriorate and can break down. Um, but I also want to turn around this discussion. I've told you about the threats, but those very threats can all be translated into opportunities. So these are some of our findings. All of this, the threats are based on this 30 years of research, all of these reaps that we've done in all of these places that you're seeing. But we also have, based on our research, found things that we can do to make our public spaces better. So instead of lack of representation, you would have evidence of the local history. You want to retain cultural symbols. You want to restore things with their social functions. You want to have adequate territories for everyone, for all the kinds of activities. In terms of privatization, Public spaces should have open access. I mean, the one thing I saw you react to was, was the gate, you know, the, the thing. That really, that image is strong. But there are lots of ways that access is restricted. But you can have open access to public space. It's incredibly important. Um, free events and activities. Seems like you have a lot. I was in Gorky, I was everywhere there are free activities. I don't need to tell you about that. There are plenty of free activities and activities. Limited regulation. We need to keep our rules down to those that we really need. 
I was incredibly impressed. Joel, where were we that I saw those incredible rules? Oh, I can't say it. It's Zariadia. It's Zariadia. Okay, Park. H have you ever looked at the list of rules? Have any of you ever noticed when you've gone there? Ha has yes. anybody? <laughs> They're incredible. They're incredible. They are so gentle and so nice and explain why you shouldn't walk on the grass. It doesn't say don't walk on the grass. I walked on the grass in the Kremlin and I got really in trouble. It says very nicely that we can't have all of you walking on the grass, so would you really consider not walking on the grass? It is the best set of rules. It's a model. I've never seen anything so good. So now go look at the list of rules and compare them to the ones I showed you on Sony Plaza. Um, another one, more cooperation and collaboration. Instead of, instead of a privatization, right, commercialization, have collaborative spaces. Come up with residential and business uh, uh, ideas and opportunities. Um, think about your public space as being a space for collaborative meaning. Securitization. In the United States, uh, the move to community policing has really been much better, has really um, moved away in which the police get to know the communities and they work together to try to solve the problems in the community. Um, have people watching instead of cameras. We know that people watching all the way back to Jane Jacobs. It's what Jane Jacobs and Holly White and Jan Gell who came here, there. Well, we all will tell you that people watching makes a place safe and knowing the people. So you don't need those security cameras. We don't even know what they're going to do with the data. We don't even know, we don't even know, it's, it, I, I, we could talk about that later. But there's the surveillance and the face recognition is getting us, I think, into a very bad place and not going to be productive in the long run. Flexible and porous borders. I am very pleased to say that in New York City, we have a new um, program and it's called Parks Without Borders in which we've been taking down fences because traditionally New York City parks all had big um, you know, uh, fences, the wrought iron, you know, turn, just like you have here, turn, uh, very turn of the century, uh, eight, you know, 19th to 20th century. Um, and they've been taking some of them down or lowering them. They've been making bigger entrances and trying to have a flow between the inside of the park and the community. They've done things like take uh, school playgrounds and take down the fences so communities can use school playgrounds on the weekend, especially in neighborhoods where there isn't adequate amount of public space. So flexible and porous boundaries are really, really work very, very well in public space. And respect and understanding instead of racial profiling, which of course you would all agree with, but to really create a kind of culture of respect and understanding of those who are different or other. And finally, on the final quadrant, you want a fair distribution of space. And I can't comment on your city. I was told in the interview that the pit is only in one neighborhood and there's another place for teenagers there and there aren't other places like that in the rest of the city. Is that true? Okay, so that's an unfair distribution. <laughs> you need to fix it. Um, procedural justice. People should have a voice and be able to participate in the decisions about how public spaces are going to be used. It needs to be collective. Social and political recognition of everyone. That's a tough one. That may be beyond the role of a planner or designer or even a social scientist, yeah? But we can still try. And finally, interactional justice for all. That people deserve, whoever they are, to be treated with respect and understanding and care in any public space, by any authority, by any manager, and by each other. And that this is a norm that we need to establish. So, let me see if I think. This is my concluding slide. So public spaces such as parks and plazas contribute to a sense of freedom, citizenship, security and identity throughout the world. It's not just here, it's everywhere. I work all over the world. There are important differences in how social justice principles are understood in their national, historical and political 
context, and I'm hoping that you're going to tell me how, how, what would be the principles, how would social justice or a just city manifest itself here for you in Moscow or the cities that you're coming from. And regardless of these different interpretations, regardless of how differently we might see issues of justice or inequality or not even have inequality, such as exists now, I guess, you know, here, there's very little inequality. It still means that public space matters, especially in cities, because there's always different kinds of difference. And as I said, these are the symbolic centers of who we are. And finally, public space, as I told you in the beginning, in the new urban agenda, is really in, is fundamental in improving